Hello and welcome to this session of the Bad Sydney Crime Writers Festival, where we're talking crime, resistance, the social novel, and perhaps what it is that crime fiction can do. I'm Kate Evans from ABC RN's Bookshelf Program, delighted to be here at the State Library in front of actual people. And a big welcome to the crime lovers joining us on Zoom, including those throughout New South Wales watching from your local library or from home, courtesy of your local library. And when I say crime lovers, I really hope it's crime fiction lovers we're addressing here. And I should add that as well as being here at the State Library of New South Wales, we are also on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Let's meet our guests, fine crime writers all, responsible for many a late night for me, many an attack of narrative greed where I just could not stop reading. Solari Gentle's books include the Roland Sinclair historical series set in the 1930s. Her latest, The Tenth, is a testament of character. She's also written numerous standalone novels, including the playful Crossing the Lines. Hi, Solari. Hello. How are you? <laughs> Sorry. Say hello again. <laughs> uh, hello, Kate. <laughs> Pleasure to be here. Robert Gott also writes historical crime fiction, among other things, including a series set in the 1940s with a rather hapless William Powers stumbling through things, and the darker murder series set in the same decade, including the holiday murders and the latest, the orchard murders. Robert, good to talk to you. It's great to be here, Kate. And Mark Brandy's novels can't easily be categorised, I think, including as they do regional crime in Wimmera, an underbelly view of cities in The Rip, and a family of outsiders in The Others. Mark, hello. Hi, Kate. Great to be here. <laughs> but what we're going to do today is test out an idea, the idea that crime fiction is or can be a literature of resistance, which raises for me both the question of what we mean by crime fiction, given its many styles, as well as quite what is being resisted and in whose terms. But this is an idea that Solari has been thinking about for quite a while. So can you set out in broad terms the case you're making here? I think um, fundamentally, Kate, um, at its heart, crime fiction is about someone standing up and saying no. It's about someone resisting an injustice and doing something about it. So a lot of um, a lot of people would look for the crime in crime fiction as a as a marker of our genre, but it's not so much that the crime, yes, necessarily has to occur, but it is the resistance to the crime, the resistance to uh, an injustice that follows, that is really the the heart of a, a crime fiction novel. And before we get into specifics and examples, I'd actually like you both, Robert and Mark, to do a sort of instant response to that idea. So Robert Gott? I have um, some queries about that and some sympathy for it. I know applying that to my own writing feels like I'm retrofitting that idea into my writing. And it, it does fit. Certainly it fits the darker series of novels that I write, but it doesn't really fit the William Power series because he doesn't, he doesn't stand up. He kind of falls forward into, into things. But I have some, well, a great deal of sympathy for it, but I can see a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of crime novels don't fit that paradigm. And that's what we'll draw out, both examples and where the, um, where the genre does and doesn't fit. But Mark Brandy, do books or should they have an agenda? I, you know, when I write my books, I like to think that I've got some kind of deeper social agenda to my work um, that, that's driving it. Certainly in the case of, of Wimra, uh, that was particularly about issues of uh, child sex abuse when I, when I write that, and that's a bit of a spoiler, but the book's been out for a while now. Um, and The Rip was really looking at issues of, of homelessness and, and poverty in inner city Melbourne. So I, I do have that drive in my work, but at the same time, I'm, I'm really wary of uh, but putting that up front in my books. You know, you, you have to be very subtle and very careful about the way you deal with those issues. Because for me, as a reader, when I pick up a work and I get the sense that the, the writer is trying to sell me a message, 
I'll, I'll kind of run in the opposite direction. So I think you have to be wary of that. I, I like the idea of, about writing a wrong, but thinking again about my own work, my, my books are quite messy. I think in, in terms of the endings, you know, that there's no neat endings. There's no real winners in my books. There's, there's losers and, and bigger losers. So I think that, that books kind of allow you to delve into that, um, that, that messiness and those subtleties in a, in a really privileged way. So, Larry, does this argument or this way of thinking about crime fiction, does it require a neat resolution or not? No, not at all. I think that's the, the thing that unites crime fiction because modern crime fiction doesn't necessarily give you this return to order that the old um, crime fiction novels used to. It, it does uh, give you messy endings. It does give you endings where the good guy doesn't win and the bad guy gets away with it. But the, at the heart of it is the fact that someone stood up and there was that resistance. Resistance doesn't necessarily mean you'll win. It doesn't mean that you'll actually prevail. It just means that you will stand up and resist. I'm interested that you use the word resistance rather than some sense of justice. Um, well, I, I think uh, as Mark was saying, you don't want to write a polemic and what is justice to one person isn't necessarily justice to another. Um, and so resistance doesn't necessarily um, prescribe that uh, the person who is standing up is actually doing it for the right reasons or in pursuit of a nobler cause. It's simply that they're standing up. So does this mean then that we're talking about crime fiction as a possible social novel? And if that's the case, Robert, what makes crime different to other types of fiction? Um, I would think that Almost all fiction is social in the way it addresses the world, if it addresses the world. I mean, all fiction addresses the world or some version of the world. So um, specific to crime fiction, I, I guess in my own case, I am looking at in the, in the darker series, questions of secular divides in Australia in the 1940s, uh, anti-Semitism. And that those sorts of divides still exist. We think we're on top of them, but we're not. And so even though my novels are historical fiction, I think they, I, I try and put deliberate echoes, forward echoes into the present world. So in that sense, I guess they are social novels, yeah. One of the other things that I think crime fiction does um, as a genre is that it travels. It goes through, it, it gives space to go into different levels of society as well as geographically to take place anywhere. And, and of course, because crime itself, because crime itself doesn't discriminate, I, I wonder, Mark, does it make it as a form particularly democratic? Again, I like that idea about it being democratic. I, I think that I wouldn't say that crime is particular in that aspect. I think a, a lot of really good fiction is um, is accessible in a way, but I think to pick up Robert's point about reflecting society in, in his case at a, a given point in time and giving that deep reflection of what's going on, I, I really like that idea because people talk in a in a general sense about whether you know books can change the world, whether books can change people's views and things like that. I think books can do that by giving a really deep reflection of society at a given point in time. In Robert's books, in his, in his series, which is fantastic, um, it's historical fiction. Uh, in, in my work, it, it tends to be more contemporary. But what you can show, you know, like when, when I think about what, what, what attracts us to crime, what, what draws us to it, and um, I'm going to go on a bit of tangent here, but, um, you know, that we have this negativity bias that's inbuilt to us. We, as a result of evolution, we look to bad news. That's why we pick up the newspaper. We love reading about crime. You know, there's that saying in journalism, um, if it bleeds, it leads, you know. Um, we, we love that stuff. And it's because we're hardwired to, to look for bad news in a way. I think what what novels do and what crime fiction does in particular is transcend those headlines. It goes really deep into a story. It goes 
deeper often than you'll see in a courtroom, you know, like it'll provide this really intense perspective of a world that you'll get nowhere else un unless you're involved in that criminal world. So I, I think that it's a, it's a wonderful exploration of that. And, and one of the, the best things for me as a writer is hearing from readers. I remember after The Rip came out, um, people contacted me saying, and some people who had, had existed on the streets and had, had gotten through that. And they said that they'd read the book and what it meant to them. And that was just incredible. But also just average people who contacted me and said, it, it made me feel different about the guy that I see down the end of my street who's, who's begging, you know? So I think that, that fiction and crime fiction can do amazing things uh, for, for people, but you, you have to be open to that, you know, as a reader as well. Because it's also a form that has various sort of solidified forms with the police procedural or the courtroom drama and so on. And some of those invite a particular perspective on crime and society or crime and justice or a particular take on, say, the police. And you all play, I think, with the perspectives of whose story you're telling, whether it's somebody investigating, whether it's the victim. I mean, there are so many ways of doing crime fiction. And I think it'd be useful to get specific, a bit more specific with each of you about your own work before we sort of go big picture again. So Solari, in your Roland Sinclair series in particular, social justice is explicit. It's at issue for your characters. Rolly and his friends are watching the rise of fascism, both in Europe and its Australian counterparts. Some of his friends are involved in political movements like communism and so on. But how does that context, how does exploring particular social movements fit in with this idea of um, crime fiction as a fiction of resistance? Well, I mean, uh, going back to what we were talking about before, about it not necessarily being a, a fiction of winning, uh, we know how uh, the 30s turned out. We know that Roland is predestined to lose his fight against fascism. Um, but the, the important thing in those novels is that he stands up and he fights, that he stands up and he says, no, and this is not right. Because, um, you know, even if he had a crystal ball to, to know that he was going to lose, there is valor in the fight. And in terms of readership, I think, you know, it was interesting when, when we were in America, Robert and I toured there a couple of years ago now. Um, one of the things that we found really interesting about uh, the difference between Australian audiences and uh, American audiences is that Australian audiences are quite comfortable with losers. Uh, well, and you know, when we said that uh, to an American audience, you could hear the audible gasp because it was such a strange term to them that we would actually side with the losers. Uh, but the wonderful thing about losers is they motivate you to get up and fight. Um, so when you see someone struggling against a bigger system and they're, they're predestined to lose, I think that actually stirs you to stand up with them. Um, so in some ways, writing crime fiction about a, a character who stands up against a larger, uh, a larger cause that he's already lost uh, is, is, a, is a way of actually rallying people to the cause. Um, so certainly with the Roland Sinclair series, my interest is in the world swing towards the right. And uh, that is not necessarily purely historical. Uh, that's something that we're seeing again today. Um, and I know that I get letters from people who read the Roland Sinclair novels and see today and see the parallels with what's happening in contemporary times and are motivated to act. Um, and that I think is, is where crime fiction can best serve its purpose as a social novel. Yes, and I was just thinking about that whole idea of losers. There's also a sense sometimes of deserving and undeserving victims. And somebody like actually the American crime writer, Michael Connolly, um, his Harry Bosch character says, everybody counts or nobody counts. And that's about making sure that the victims are dealt with in the same way. Although I do think that the police 
crime detective and the police procedural raises a whole lot of other questions that we might get to. But I'm keen to hear more about um, each of your work. And Robert, there's power plays at the heart of your latest novel, The Orchard Murders, the power of charisma and religion, the powerlessness of some of the other characters, and it's all happening in regional Victoria. Perhaps you can explain what's going on and reflect how that does or doesn't fit in with this argument. Yeah, this is almost unbelievable. It's almost unbelievable, except we kind of all know that people are stupid. <laughs> and in the 1850s in Melbourne, there's an, there's an outer suburb of Melbourne, which up until about the 1960s was all orchards, and it's called Nunawadding. And in the 1850s, there was a bloke in Nunawadding who styled himself the Nunawadding Messiah. And he convinced hundreds of people that he was the Messiah. And the Messiah had chosen to come to Nunawadding. And they paid him money and he guaranteed them immortal life. And it wasn't immortal life post-mortem. It was immortal life here. If you paid him money, you would not die. And if you did die, as people did, well, clearly you didn't have enough faith. And he was taken to court by s someone who wanted his money back because his wife died. And um, the judge said, if you're stupid enough to believe this, you don't deserve to win. And so the case was thrown out. But anyway, I took that case and I set the novel in Nunawading in 1944 and reignited the Nunawading Messiah idea. So I've got a, a bloke out there in Nunawading in 1944 who styles himself the Messiah and has um, a lot of followers, but it's extremely unpleasant because there are murders, the murders involved in that story. I always say that book opens with a dead baby, so you know it's good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and the shocking opening in, in a crime novel is such a thing, isn't it? But, Mark, characters in your latest novel, The Others, they're acting outside of the law, outside of conventional society, and that's a deliberate choice by the, the father in the story. And so, in a sense, as a story of resistance, what he's resisting is us, is conventional society. So I wonder if, without giving too much away, I wonder if you could explain what you're doing in that novel. Yeah, the the others is is quite different from my first two books. Um, it's the story of a young boy and his father who are living a very isolated existence out in the wilderness, and the story is told from the son Jacob, his perspective through diary entries, and we see that the world kind of mediated through his father who keeps talking about the others and this threat over the hill. Um, if the others come, uh, you know, we'll be imperiled. It's, it's interesting that when I was writing that book, and particularly when I was going through edits, was when the pandemic hit. And, and I was seeing, I suppose, some of the, the things I was writing about play out in, in real life. And I don't pretend for any second that the novel was prescient. I, I don't think novels are that at all. Um, but, but seeing really the way society kind of fractured in some ways, um, even in, in small ways, like um, you know, people making a rush at the supermarket to buy toilet paper and all that sort of thing. It was, it was, it was quite, quite surreal um, writing the book with that happening in the background. But I, I guess what, to go back to what drove uh, the, the writing of the others, it was really a, a, a moral question. It was about what is good and what is bad. And what interests me about that is the extent to which it's socialised and the extent to which it is inherited. And I think that that is something that... <laughs> is an eternal debate basically in our society. And you see it play out in courtrooms as well, that when a, a perpetrator is being sentenced, they'll talk about their upbringing and their background and what occurred. And I was interested in exploring that through a child's perspective who was living this very uh, peculiar life and in, in many ways a, a very distressing life and to see how that would shape him as a person. Um, you know, I, I think the question about what is good and bad in our society and what is right and wrong 
drives a lot of readers to crime fiction because I think we want to know where the boundaries lie. Now, the, the ultimate boundaries lie in our society, in legislation and in the law and who ends up before the courts. But we're also looking for, for moral guidance in a way. And crime fiction can offer that. You know, we're living in an increasingly secular world. Um, there's great distrust about the political class. Um, I'm at risk of overstating the impact of crime fiction here, but I think the, the people... You've got the right audience. Yeah, well, that's true. Um, I, I think when, well, certainly when I read, the, there are subtle messages and cues that you, you pick up on. And, you know, when you're immersed in that world and you care about those characters, you want them to do well, you want them to survive. You also want the wrongs to be righted in some way. So you're also, you are looking for that to occur. And to go back to my earlier point about the, the messiness of, of, of some of my, my endings, I think what we see, and, and certainly what I know of the justice system um, and my background in it, is that there are no there, there are no winners. If you go into a, a courtroom, there are no winners. It's just it's losers all around. But basically, the winners are the lawyers who, who might get a new pool at the end of the day. But um, it, it's it's a really at that pointy end of the system. It can it can be really awful for people. And so I suppose I'm always interested in unpicking what gets you to that point, what gets you to that stage of committing a crime, and particularly for ordinary people. And I think that that's what's attractive about crime fiction for a lot of readers. And I think less and less are we seeing crime novels that have a neat resolution, the sort of the conventional mystery puzzle novel. I mean, it still exists but we don't so often get everybody together in the drawing room at the end and go, <laughs> so, and then finally it's, it must be you who did it. Um, and I think, again, that's the pleasure of a, a, a sort of complex genre. Um, and this is a point where I'll remind you all that you're all being very polite as I am asking questions to each of you, but feel free to leap in and respond or refute or add to a discussion. But I wonder if I could play a sort of devil's advocate for the moment. Um, and this is speaking as somebody who is a fan of crime fiction and I read a lot of it and I really like the sort of flexibility of the genre, that it can do so many things. But, there, but I have certainly read some crime fiction that makes me uneasy. And some of the discomfort, um, and particularly in some types of American crime fiction, is about a sort of vigilante justice that gets played out where, um, where somebody decides to take justice into their own hand. And it's often related to a commitment to guns and also to an idea that the criminal justice system doesn't serve us. And I'm not suggesting that the justice system is perfect, but some of those novels where the supposed bad guy gets shot up in the end, as well as the way in which crime fiction sometimes fetishizes violence, particularly violence against women, does make me uneasy. And so I'm wondering where that type of crime fiction fits, again, fits with this argument. I mean, maybe it's resisting something, but whether it's resisting something we're comfortable with. Well, I think the resistance in, in that type of crime fiction is in the conversation, the fact that it raises that as an issue. So crime fiction is um, really well positioned to get people talking about moral issues. Uh, to get people considering it. Um, so the fact that that novel makes you uneasy, I think actually raises that question um, in the social consciousness and actually puts it out there for debate. Um, so I don't know whether that was the, the writer's intention. Maybe the writer thinks it's perfectly okay. Or maybe the writer wanted to start a discussion about how far is it okay to go based on what has happened to you before. And certainly we saw that with a lot of the, the novels about women who had been abused for 40 years in marriage, suddenly taking revenge and so on. And, and the conversations that came out of that is, you know, is there something wrong with our legal system that people are driven to that point? And I don't necessarily see those books as advocacy of vigilantism, but a critique of a system that is failing people. I think you're giving those writers far too much credit. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we're talking about the straight vigilante novel 
which is represented on screen in films like Charles Bronson's film. Well, Charles Bronson was one of the very first people to make a vigilante movie. What was that film called? Sorry? Death Wish. Yeah. And then there was Death Wish 2, 3, 4, 5. I don't know. That was but. before I was born, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> um, so and I don't like those novels at all, but I don't mind reading a crime novel that makes me feel uncomfortable. I don't need to read a novel and like the characters in the novel. So I, for example, I will, I like Patricia Highsmith's novels and no one's going to stand up and say that Tom Ripley is a paragon of virtue. Mm -hmm. He's a psychopath, but I will read a Tom Ripley novel because they're beautifully written. And because she was a very, very strange per person. She had a fetish for snails. She used to breed snails as companions, not as food. And when she went to a party, she'd put a hundred snails in her handbag with a bit of lettuce and take them to a, a dinner party. And there's something... <laughs> I don't know what that means, but <laughs> I like her books. <laughs> well, and there's something subversive and interesting about Highsmith's novels. And I guess I was thinking of some where um, there's one writer who I just stopped reading as the violence against women became so sadistic that, and I couldn't see the point of it mm. in the novel. And I quite like reading fiction that makes me uncomfortable, but this was a different type of discomfort. Um, but I guess the, the other thing that I'm curious about, particularly because Mark and Solari, you both actually have a background that connects more conventionally to the law, is um, the relationship between crime fiction and the criminal justice system because it's almost like a conversation there's a there's sometimes a real playfulness there and I wonder what you make of that I don't know is it tension is it in concert I yeah I, I love one, one of my favorite things I'd have to say is um one of my brothers is a, a prosecutor uh he works in the Victorian courts and occasionally a, a judge will say are you Mark Brandy's brother? <laughs> and go, yes, Your Honour. And that they will have read some of my work. So I, I'm just I, blown away when that happens. <laughs> I don't know what they think of me or my brother at that point. Um, they're probably horrified. Um, but but to go, if I can go back briefly to your point about the vigilantism, um, I think it's a, a point well made. And I, I haven't read a lot of that kind of novel, I have to say, but as you were speaking, I think I'm kind of guilty of that to an extent because in, in Wimra, there is an act of uh, complete vengeance against the, again, I'm giving away spoilers. I shouldn't be doing this. No one will buy my books now. Um, but there's an act of, uh, of revenge against the, um, the sinister character of, of, of Ronnie um, in, in brutal detail. But I, I think that most readers kind of feel that that's justified when they read the book. Well, and it's hope. often very satisfying. But, I mean, I think it's actually more of a trope in um, crime TV, or it was in, in crime TV in particular, where cops would do things that weren't, you know, quite in the code. Oh, look, and, and I get that. I, I understand that. I know uh, uh, my husband hates watching Franny Fisher with me because I, I absolutely explode every time she walks onto a crime scene and steals evidence. Um, but, you know... It, and that's, and you, were, were, you are a lawyer. I was a lawyer. And, and so that, that does great on me. Um, but there's a difference between the, the novel and the actual fact, the reality. So I always... Uh, see those stretches in a novel and you know realistically uh, an amateur detective is never ever going to be allowed to to have the abilities that we give him in novels or her in novels to interfere with a police case but the readership allows us that latitude so we can have this other discussion um, and so I don't ever really see the the vigilantism solely as a, a depiction of reality. It's more a, a depiction of, I think, a system that doesn't uh, deal with uh, the injustices to particular areas of society. So recently I read a wonderful novel by an American 
uh, Indigenous writer called uh, David Haskey, Heskey Hambly, Winter Counts. And it's all about uh, this justice on the reservations where the police will not go. Uh, and it is very violent and it is bordering on a sort of a, an agreed vigilantism. Uh, but that entire novel was about resistance against a system that did not account for entire groups of people. Um, so I, I, I think there is a, you know, as much as you can be horrified by the reality of what's going on in the page, there's actually something that the art says that's more than that. Yes, because it is, we are after all talking about fiction. We're yep, talking about exactly. storytelling and we're talking about reading yep. rather than what happens um, in the world. But I think police procedurals are really interesting, partly because of the way that they've changed over the last century or so. And particularly in, Aust in Australia, we've seen so many police procedurals that end up pivoting on the question of police corruption. Yep. So the relationship of police to the world and the stories we're willing to tell about them has changed, hasn't it? I mean, actually, I'm not sure that either any of you have police as major characters. Do yeah. You? Yeah. Yes? yeah. This Robert, uh, this. Um... My, my, um, the first three in this series is mainly set in the homicide unit of Melbourne Police Force, which only became a discrete unit separate from the rest in 1943. But I was particularly interested in women in the police force and how that that has changed because in the 1940s there were only I think four women who were fully qualified police persons and they were obliged to wear civilian clothes because the police hierarchy didn't think a uniform would be necessary because a woman would never be promoted and so she wouldn't need that extra line on her um, shirt and it took in the 1940s, it took one woman, I think, 35 years to move from constable to senior constable. And you can imagine all of the duds who were being promoted above her. And I was very interested in the role of women. And in my the apologies, because I have read, I have read your women, I promise. I you do read an awful one. lot, Kate. <laughs> Um, and in fact, there's been some fantastic crime fiction that have done exactly that, have taken us to the margins of a sort of conventional society. And I've read stories of um, black police units in America and the discrimination they faced was gobsmacking. Um, there's, as you say, there's Native American crime fiction, Hispanic traditions that also play with different literary forms as well, some of which are just wild and sort of and melodramatic. So writing from the margins, how important is that to thinking about what crime fiction can do? And mm. anybody can take that and start giving us some examples so that we've all got extra, you know, reading lists. Um, okay. Uh, well, this in terms of uh, police forces, which are, um, which don't welcome um, certain, um, certain classes of people, uh, Marla Nunn's work, uh, which is set in a South African police force. Um, and, you know, it's, it, I was just thinking when Robert was talking about um, his interest is in women in the police force in, uh, in Victoria in the 1940s, simply writing that, simply placing a woman into your novel is an act of resistance. Um, and so, you know, the, the resistance doesn't necessarily have to be giving, um, giving a character a badge or sending them to a protest. Uh, sometimes simply depicting them within the literature is, is pushing back against a, a system that wants to crowd them out. Well, and that example that you gave of Marla Nunn's books, yeah. um, if people haven't read them, it's set in South Africa in the 1950s under apartheid. Mm. And the, her central character is officially you know, classified as a person of colour and his passing. Um, as a white policeman. So everything that he does is walking a sort of fine line of justice and injustice and resistance just by being there. Um, and I think they're a fantastic series. And, and his sidekick is a Zulu man. Um, and it's beautiful. But Marla's Nun is extraordinary. Uh, Marla Nun's work is extraordinary. And sidekicks are so interesting in crime fiction, which I think, Solari, you've spoken about before too. But I've just finished reading Abir Mukherjee's mm. latest novel, historical fiction set in um, India, and it's sort of leading up to Petition, 
but with the latest one, he's given the, the white policeman's offsider, surrendering us um, a, a voice in a different way as a, an Indian man in the police force who, again, works under different, under different laws. Um, uh, Robert, give us another example of something. Um, I, maybe you can help me with this, this author's name, Kate. He writes a series of novels set in the dedicated African-American police unit in America in the 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s. I think his first name's Thomas. I was going to say, I think his first name's Thomas and was hoping that I would remember what <laughs> his last name is and I can see a brown book cover. Yeah. But keep on describing them and I'll see but if they, I But they are fantastic. They are really distressing to read because he pulls absolutely no punches about the experience of being a black policeman among white policemen. They are very, very, very distressing read, but well worth it. And again, that whole question of what resistance means is interesting yeah. because I think from memory, those members of the, the black units weren't allowed to be seen on the streets in their uniform no. because that transgressed all the ideas of where power lay. Well, they weren't allowed to arrest a white person. Which, as you imagine, could was a little tricky. Tricky. <laughs> <laughs> And whatever, does anybody else in the room, can anybody else yell out with the name of that series? There's oh, two, only two or three. I think, think there's a three. white writer um, and I have interviewed him um, on Radio National, <laughs> but I cannot off the top of my head remember the series. But historical crime fiction is something that I particularly enjoy reading because you do get taken into different levels of society um, and different senses of place. Um, but... Mark, you, I mean, you mentioned it before, but in, um, in your second novel, you're going into homeless communities and there is a crime, but the way that you're telling the story, like the person who's aware of what's happening, gives us a different perspective on it. So I guess that's the other thing fiction does, doesn't it? It sort of shifts focus. Yeah. And it's the great thing about crime fiction and about crime readers really is that they're voracious readers and you know the crime genre is such a, a, a broad church there are, for the fact that I fit into it I think is a testament to that because my work wouldn't neatly fit if you went back 30 40 years ago I don't think people would have necessarily considered it as as crime fiction you know there, there are a lot of lot of literary books that I think could be considered as crime fiction if you want to bring that that lens to it um, I was even thinking about going all the way back to The Stranger by Camus, where this character of Mousseau uh, shoots a man on, on the beach, but when he's brought to trial, what's ultimately brought to bear is the fact that he didn't cry at his mother's funeral and in, in Algeria. And, you know, if we think about the modern context of our, our courtrooms and the way things play out in social media as well, and the attitudes towards sometimes the perpetrators and victims, even going back to Lindy Chamberlain as well, that these issues are perennial in our society. They're always going to be issues. For, for my work, it's always about character first. And so for the rip with the uh, homeless character of Danny on the streets of Melbourne, it was about exploring that, that worldview and, and trying to make it real for readers. I think that the crime, I don't want to say it's incidental to the story, but it, it's not my, my main driver in, in writing. There's it. a whiff. There's, there's, a smell there's a whiff of crime, in the room, exactly. If anybody's read the novel. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> What's that smell? <laughs> yes. Oh, thank Thomas you. Thomas Mullen, thank you very much for. <laughs> Thomas Mullen, well done, Scott. Great work. <laughs> thank they you. are really worth reading if you can get a hold of them. If I can just add about police um, procedurals in, in particular in the way that um, the police are depicted, I really love uh, Gary Dish's Hirschhausen series and, and particularly the last, I think it was the last one, Constellation, is that right? Um, one of, he just writes about these communities in, in such a sophisticated, delicate way and the way that he kind of unpicks the way small I mean small towns crime it's such a trope in our world of like Australian crime fiction in one sense but he he does it in this um incredibly sophisticated way and what I really loved about the last book was that he 
looked at white collar crime and the impact on the community and the permutations of that, which is something which like a, a lot of crime fic fiction doesn't deal with and it is a reality in our society. And I suppose going back to my earlier point about trying to give a, a deep reflection of what it is that our community is facing at a particular point in time is what good crime fiction can do and, and what all good fiction does, I think. And that's also a great example too, because it's a reminder of how the ways in which in the world crime is politicised and crime statistics are politicised and some crimes are given more credence than other others. And of course, financial and white collar crime has such a huge impact. And that's one of the things that I think is interesting about Jane Harper's The Dry mm -hmm. is that he's a daggy forensic detective going through the numbers, even though he was transformed into the gorgeous Eric Banner on screen, which I actually had to go and check the description and go, mm, okay, <laughs> he's become a little more handsome. I also love the way in so much contemporary crime fiction, um, the police procedurals, everybody's worried about overtime and costs. And so it becomes a story of workplaces, which in a way I think is also radical because, you know, people are, and there are some novels where the, it's a, a working woman who is looking at the the time she's going to be able to finish a shift and pick up her kids. There's a there's a couple of wonderful uh, police procedurals by Pam Newton that were out a couple of years ago. That was um, that was the old school and beams falling, and they looked at police forces in the 1980s, and her uh, her lead character was Ned or New Kelly, who was a half Vietnamese cop dealing with all the issues um, whilst they were looking for the the body of a an indigenous woman I believe uh, but it was beautifully done and it was it's it's really interesting to see that in a police procedural that's um, that's not not contemporary but not completely historic uh, you can still see the trails of the 1980s in the police force today um, and so it was a I found it a really eye-opening thing. I was a kid in the 1980s, so it really rang um, home to me about what was going on in the wider community whilst, you know, I was trotting off to high school. And from the, I think she's a former cop as well. She is, and I think she was an undercover cop um, as well. So she knows this stuff with, with how it works and um, who does what and who says what. Um, and one of one of the reasons I've never written a police procedural is that there is so much inside knowledge that you need to have to to pull it off well. Not to mention the trouble that you can get in doing the research. Yes, I remember. I think it was Ian Rankin when he was only nineteen turned up to the local police station to ask them all sorts of questions about what you do with a dead body, and um, they were <laughs> very very suspicious. <laughs> Um, so we've talked about police procedurals and we've talked about various other types of fiction, but I'd like to I'd like to hear you all talk about the amateur investigator because that's both something with a very long tradition, but also something that gives different people power. Um, so the amateur detective, Robert. Uh, yeah, my first series is about an amateur detective, who I wanted a character who was. Um, vain, inward looking, completely solipsistic um, and not very, not very bright. And I thought, I'll make him an actor because <laughs> that seemed like a good fit. And uh, yeah, he's an, he's an amateur detective, but he doesn't solve anything. Other people around him solve everything because he's too stupid and uh, he, he takes the, the credit. So I worked on that idea of the amateur, mainly out of laziness, because if you're working with an amateur in the 1940s, you don't have to know anything about forensics or procedurals or the legal system. You just have him bumble through, which is what I do. So you could say it's a satire on the amateur detective, but essentially it's a kind of dilettantish way of writing a series of novels. And Mark, I don't know whether you'd call any of your characters amateur detectives, but it's more, is it we as the readers who are trying to solve things? Yeah, I, I think there's always that sense in my work that you're reading a little bit deeper between the lines about what's going on, certainly in, in the others. Uh, we, we we almost take a 
um, caring relationship to the young boy Jacob and we can see through his illustrations on the page uh, the definitions that he's using in the dictionary and the encyclopedia which are his only books uh, that something else is going on here the father's telling him one thing but this isn't the real world in a sense so he's kind of an amateur detective I suppose Jacob in, he, in his own way um, I have to say I'm not very I haven't read a lot of uh, amateur detective fiction but because I know Robert I'm going to say that his series is fantastic because we're friends well why don't we add... <laughs> want to stay friends with him I think you haven't read it <laughs> <laughs> And you did the drawings in your book, didn't you? I, I did, yeah. The, They're the... very convincingly bad. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. They, they, they happened at about midnight one night up in my, my loft. And I, at that point, I never thought those illustrations would see the light of day. I, I, I really thought that if the publisher published the manuscript, they would get someone proper in to do the illustrations, you know. I was thinking Sean Tan or someone like that. So I, I thought these scrawls, I didn't think that they would, would ever make it onto the page, which I think was a good thing because I, I, I did them in this really uninhibited way. I was in the viewpoint of Jacob, what would an 11-year-old boy, how would he draw a lamb at this point? And so I just scrawled it. Yeah. So I've still got those original pictures if uh, you know if things get really bad I might sell them on eBay or something you can't fake incompetent drawing <laughs> <laughs> coming coming from a, a true artist of course Robert. well you have given me an unexpected segue though which is the artist as amateur detective so Rolly Sinclair yeah so I, I suppose the reason that uh, an artist is handy as an amateur detective is that he's observant so artists are necessarily observant um, and so it gave me someone who had one an, an interesting perspective, but who looked at things carefully. Um, the delightful thing about an aperture detective is that he's just an ordinary person. Um, so uh, writing amateur detective fiction basically follows the message that an ordinary person can make a difference if they care enough if they're willing to act on on the things they believe in um and he's you know like this um when I first conceived of Roland Sinclair um I knew that I was writing in the 1930s I needed a character who could walk in all levels of society and and so I initially made him an artist so that I could connect him with the left wing while facing him in the establishment um but what that did is it gave us a similar way of looking at the world. Um, I'm not an artist by any means, but I do, I draw. Um, so as soon as Roland became an artist, all of a sudden we could, I could see the world through his eyes. So he looks at, uh, he looks at things as compositions and he, he looks at people in terms of how interesting they would be to paint rather than how conventionally attractive they are. Um, and it's that ability to see the world through a protagonist's eyes that make them come alive on the page um, and I think if I had not if I had given him some other entrance into the into the left ring rather than making him an artist he wouldn't have actually worked for me um, because he's not he's not anything like me um, and the one connection that we have is this uh, is this way of looking out at the world and paying attention and being very, very interest, interested in um, injustice. Um, look, this would be a good time to, to pause and hear from you guys um, if you've got any questions, which what I would need you to do is ask and then I will repeat so that um, people on Zoom can hear. And people on Zoom, if you have questions, if you would put it in the chat and uh, through very sophisticated technology, it's going to be handed to me on a piece of paper. <laughs> to ask. So who would like to either um, ask a question or offer up an example of perhaps a piece of crime fiction that either does or doesn't fit with this argument? Um, don't be shy. I know that there are a lot of extraordinary readers in this room, not to mention a few writers. So actually, while you wave your hand in the air, and if you're being too shy, I will um, throw in another question. Uh, okay. Go for it. I, I recently... Okay, I'm just going to repeat that for um, our people on Zoom. So um, 
you were reading a book called Castle of Sand, published in the 1960s, which was partly exploring the rejection, perhaps rejection of crime fiction by the literary establishment. So is there a place for crime fiction itself to resist the literary establishment, if there is such a thing as a literary establishment, I guess? I'm not fussed by, the, if there is such a thing as the literary establishment, I'm not fussed by the perception that it rejects crime fiction. I mean, the member of the literary establishment. That's certainly, <laughs> certainly, you won't see many apart from The Broken Shore by Peter Temple. I think that is the only crime novel to be. Did it win the Miles Franklin that year? It did. Mm. To be shortlisted, let alone win. I think that's the only one. So we're never going to make those lists, I wouldn't think. But I'm not in any way uh, fussed by that. Because there, there is a lot of literary writing. Um, I mean, a lot of crime fiction is very literary. Uh, sorry, we have a question or comment. Truth, it was too. Yeah. It was Truth that won the Miles Franklin. And uh, a critic and academic Sue Turnbull says it should have been. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and sorry, I think uh, Mark or Solara, you're going to respond to that question. I, I love that question. <laughs> it's fantastic. Great question. Um, I um, look, you'd always love to be winning awards and things like that. It'd be it'd be great, and it, it is nice when it happens. But it, it's not why you do it. Um, as I think it was Cyril Lestrange actually pointed out to me, uh, one day I was having a whinge about crime fiction doesn't make it onto these shortlists, etc. And she just flatly said to me, well, it's better to have readers, isn't it? And <laughs> I thought, yeah, yeah, you're right. It's true. You know, and that's the thing. Like it, it, the grass is always greener. I think in a sense, you always think, oh, it'd be nice to have, have that. But we operate in a very rarefied world I think as as writers and it just seems to me to be a bit cheeky to be asking for that that little bit extra it'd still be nice I'm not saying if anyone's here who's a judge on the Miles Franklin you know <laughs> it'd be nice I'd be I'd be happy um, years ago with my very first book uh, it was shortlisted for the Commonwealth Writers Prize in in this region, which is a literary prize. And I remember trotting up to the award ceremony at one, uh, it was at uh, uh, Martin Place, I think one Macquarie Avenue or something of the sort, uh, at the old post office buildings. And it was all very posh. And all the other names were big literary writers. Um, and they were all sort of standing around with the literati around them. Um, and the writers were all lovely, but there's there's a whole stack of attachments. And I remember, <laughs> I remember everybody's standing around and they're talking. And because we were in the best first book category, they asked me the question which everybody asks first debut crime writers is, when's the next one coming out? Or uh, debut writers, when's the next one coming out? And I made the mistake of saying the sequel's already written. And there was this gasp again <laughs> in the room. And I realized my mistake because only genre has sequels. Um, and, and then someone in the group said, oh yes, you wrote the detective story. And, <laughs> and I sort of slunk away into the corner to stand with my dad because he thinks I'm great. And <laughs> but I, I, I do see what you mean. I like it. Um, I like this. And, and I do, you do sometimes feel like staying within a genre uh, is, is an act of defiance. Uh, against the push and pull of um, uh, of the award ceremony, um, and and I and I and I can see that. And sometimes I think writing itself is an act of resistance when the the world seems to be conspiring against people doing something thoughtful and long form. Um, so yes, basically, Felix. And yes to the arts, of course. And we have another question here. Um, I might just repeat that. Um, so sticking to the genre is an interesting question, Solari, given that you have written two standalone novels, uh, including Crossing the Lines and another one about to come out, both of which are, include stories within a story and don't necessarily fit with crime fiction. Um, and I would add, as an aside, we, we might put a question over how much Mark's second novel in particular would sit within a, the conventional crime bookshelves in um in the bookshops so is that 
a piece of resistance in itself, writing outside the genre that has partly made you. I, I, I think that that that's true because the genre, as much as, you know, crime writers, we love our genre, we love the norms of it. It is uh, a natural instinct for writers to push the edges on the, of the envelope, to try and create something new. And this, the drive to reinvent the genre or to play with it or to not let it become set in stone, I think is an act of resistance. Um, because I think crime fiction needs to evolve just as society evolves. And the moment that we start to talk about rules um, and start to box writers in within rules, then we are going to undo uh, the benefits of our own genre. And perhaps both of you would like, Robert and Mike would like to respond to that as well. Um, writing outside uh, my genre is a relief because you do get sick of your characters. You just do after write, staying with them for so long. And so my next book is a satire about <clears throat> a politician who agrees to be painted nude for the Archibald Prize. <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> Which is very much not in the genre. <laughs> but it was a great pleasure to write it. <laughs> Look forward to that, Robert. <laughs> Um, I, I don't tend to think that much about genre when I write, um, which probably shows, I think, in, in my work. Uh, I, I suppose I, you, you're trying to tell the story that you, you want to tell. You want to make the characters as real as possible, make that world as real as possible. You want the bloody thing to work, basically, is your main, main goal. I think questions of, of genre for me at least, are ultimately in the hands of my delightful publisher who's here today. And that they'll kind of make that call as to where my book sits on the shelves, as will booksellers. You know, I go into different bookshops, I'll find my books, because I always look for my books, of course. It's, we all pretend not to, but that's what we're there for. But I'll <coughs> find it in crime, the crime section, I'll find it in Australian fiction, I'll find it in literary fiction, I'll find my work all over the place which I think is great, you know, I, I don't have any problem with that. And I think, you know, readers will still find your work if they, they like what you, you're doing and if the, the work and the characters are connecting with them. That's, that's really the main thing. Not in the art section. Not in the art, no, or coffee table <laughs> section. Well, and I think um, crime readers are very generous readers. And when speaking to Michael Connolly a few years ago, he said the thing about crime readers, because I asked why... Uh, why he thought crime writers are so generous with each other because you can never speak to a crime writer without them recommending another crime writer's work and his line on it was that it's because crime readers never read just one mm -hmm. they always read a lot in that field so there are probably useful reasons to be put in this in the crime area but crime fiction as a literature of resistance I'm Kate Evans from ABC RN, and our guests today are the writers Solari Gentle, Robert Gott, and Mark Brandy. Please do thank them all. <laughs>